Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's nice to be here, and thank you for the kind introduction. I've got Tim Lafferty and uh, Jeff Chi, who's with me on my panel, and I'll introduce their companies and uh, uh, their day jobs and non-day jobs, if they'd like. Uh, when they, uh, but um, there will be uh, some slides. Uh, normally, I don't do slides. Normally, I just kind of talk, as Ellie well knows. Now, I was told I was going to be presenting to 200 young brains. Yeah. I was presenting to 200 young minds, anywhere from the age of 18 to 80, who are going to come here and change the world. So where did the other 180 go? <laughs> but the minds are all sparky, and given the, the time of day that it's 4 o'clock, is that you? Should I take it? So anyway, all right. Venture, as you know, started off in the 70s in the United States. Uh, where did it start, folks? Where did it start, Venture in the United States? East Coast. Oh, you can't say anything. Boston. 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 How many of you knew that? Did you raise your hand? No. Just had a, we just had a talk about the history of Venture. So. Yeah. Oh, you did? You cheaters. <laughs> you complete cheaters. Uh, at least stole your time back. Now, wh what brought it to the West Coast besides the genius of Stanford? What, what was the nuance that Stanford offered? Sunshine. That's one thing. But Boston also got nice sunshine in the month of August. Free agricultural land that was being turned into a workspace. And so they made a deal with the state of California and they made a deal with the local government to be able to incubate and create the companies that were uh, then uh, put in place. So um, you want to uh, kick in my slides? OK. All right. So we're looking at um, the first slide. Yeah. OK. Now, what drives venture? And venture is driven by the edge of technology. It's driven by those whose minds will go where others haven't. And it's driven by the needs of the population. So the question is where, after World War II, a huge amount of scientific knowledge went into the United States because you had very intelligent academic institutions that were able to bring them over and offer very good uh, uh, positions, like NYU, for example, um, offered a whole series of engineers jobs and um, homes, and so they all moved over. So you had this in, in very fertile environment, in a homogeneous type environment, where you had a real change in the people. Now, that change, as of 2012, whether it's GDP as a percent of total growth, or the consumer, the user, is moving east. And the question is, how do you capture it? Consumer products are starting to figure this one out because consumer products are all taking their brands from Europe and the United States and moving them east. But how do these minds work? How will these people work? But the statistics are overwhelming when you think that the middle class by 2020 in Asia will equal the total population of Europe. And they all will be driven by the modern world. You got to remember when Central Europe changed from its political regime. Banking never had a checkbook. They went straight into electronic banking. There was never a checkbook. So how will things change? And for those minds and academics that believe that there's some linearity or duplicity, that's not going to be the case whatsoever. And if you ask the U.S. government, some of the brightest minds are in China, who they keep trying to work with <laughs> to stop coming into the U.S. information systems, correct? So the minds are there, the talent is there, but the use of it will be absolutely fascinating. And so the question is, will science drive or will the consumer drive? Will we look for making returns or will we looking to create the edge of technology? Will we change science? To change science, you need government backing. You need full-fledged policies. Europe failed. They, and they created the European Investment Fund, who is the main source of all funding for Europe. 
venture and it struggles because after you get the EIF, it's very hard to get more people in, into it. And so when you go into the United States, they were fortunate because in the 70s, uh, they were able to get the endowments and the foundations involved and through the academic institutions and their, their funding bases, were able to build a fantastic environment which stimulated both a consumer-led technology as well as a um, scientific technology. Now, uh, U.S. venture capital just dominates statistically. The question is, can it change? And the issue here is it's been around such a long time that it has a huge amount of positioning. But if you look at the essence of venture capital financing, if you look at the essence of angels and seed and startups, you can't scale venture capital. What is scalable is to come up with an idea, package the idea, turn it into a corporate, develop the corporate, grow it, list it, and then somebody buys it as a buyout. The very first transaction in Asia, apparently, is around the corner that will have done that cycle, which is interesting. The largest deals in Asia, these are some of them. As you can see, they cut across different uh, sectors. Um, where there seems a lot of activity is taken through the internet. Now, one of the things that is fascinating, this morning I went to a consumer product specialist who specializes in products in China. And the biggest area of focus for food products and food product distribution, snacks, was internet sales. I don't buy my potato chips on the web, right? I, I, I can't, I don't, I don't quite associate, I can't understand this. But, but this has doubled the profitability of a particular company, right? Now, my children, who are 25 and 23, my daughter is in publications, she has her magazine, my son's in media. Um, they sit there and they want to eat something, they need a, a document, they need a little pointer and they go to these apps and they click, click, and then some random person walks in and hands them the stuff. I can't relate to this, right? Now, my best friend from childhood, who's my age, 57, creates the software. I used to write software because my computers used to be as big as this room and the only way to communicate was to write software, right? But the applications of this is amazing. Now, the question is, how many of these companies will be with us in five years, 10 years, 15 years? If you take the Fortune 500 in the United States and you look at every 10 years, they're very different companies, very different companies. So will this kind of follow and how will this work in will be very interesting. Performance, performance is everything. Now, while performance of the mature venture capital has strengthened, overall, it, um, it varies a little bit. Now, uh, the US performance is very steady and very long, and you can kind of see how it works over a period of time when you look at, at these types of numbers and you look at how that outperforms everything. But in the short term, venture does not have this type of, of um, you know, uh, benefit. And, and if you compare it to other uh, classes, sometimes, um, you know, and this is the best groups that you can look at, it, it can be lacking. And that was part of the problem with the European venture. And European venture was not profitable, except for one or two individuals that were able to drive certain uh, opportunities or to identify them. Now, Asia is still extremely nascent. And within this, one of the things that we need to be very careful about when we look at um, a venture, again, it goes back to the essence of the science uh, or the kind of uh, corporate element that we're trying to kind of be the end product of the creation of, of venture or the or of venture products is um, where do we want to, to take these? And um, uh, you know, if your objective is to list a company, chances are very high you're going to not perform. 
And so back in the early 2000s, when some companies, like for example in Europe and life science, were doing incredibly well, one of the things that they needed to do, because they couldn't fund, uh, they could not find funding, they listed themselves. And they basically locked in whatever return profile they had at that point. Because the listing, uh, because of the volatility of the, of the market, because of the illiquidity of the particular companies, were not able to get anywhere. So to the extent one can avoid listing as late as possible, it's extremely important. And so the question is, where do you get the capital from to be able to grow the companies? And the, the, the trick is the science versus the profitability. And so all those that are in the room that are creators have to leave the room because you're not business people. And you have to give control away. And that's really hard to do. So now a good friend of mine, uh, well, a good friend of my son's, created something that put everybody together. It matched made them. And um, the young man is outstanding in this technology. He's outstanding in his uh, understanding of um, uh, marketing and messaging, but the business had to be run by somebody who runs the business. So he was given a couple billion dollars. Part of it's still in the company. He's still involved. Part of it is in his cash account. Um, but now somebody is running this company and kind of really building it, right? Uh, but then the question is, at that point, that edge of the technology is not, he's not there anymore. He's kind of going with that corporate flow, right? In a way, it's almost would be more neat to release him to go create another company, even if it is a competition, because he's a mind, and keep feeding him cash, let him become whatever he'd like to become, and, ch and help him change the world, as opposed to, to kind of cocooning him. So he's at that crossroad right now. Now, interestingly enough, um, where is the next uh, hub? What areas are interesting? Um, you know, in today's world, it can be anywhere, to be very honest. And what drives people sometimes is governments uh, that offer initiatives and offer um, think tanks and areas of, of opportunity like, you know, we have here. Um, and, and in other cases, it's the young people. In San Francisco, the rental prices have gone up 10 times. They're still cheaper than New York. So New York has nobody that's at the cutting edge of creation. They're still on the West Coast. But guess what, folks? They're moving to Portland, Oregon. Because Portland, Oregon, the rents are one-fifth what they are in San Francisco. And, you know, it's not a bad life either. So you move north, you move south, it doesn't matter anymore. But one thing I know which is really interesting when talking to a venture investor, um, he doesn't look at numbers anymore. He doesn't look at reports anymore. He doesn't look at track records anymore. He just looks at the people. And he follows the people. So when I ask him, I say, where have you been? He goes, I was in Miami. Where have you been? I've been in Vegas. Where have you been? In New York. I was like, what are, are, they, are the people from there? He said, no, the people are just hanging out. <laughs> and so they, they've become a hangout crowd. Now, the investor appetite is definitely there. Um, and this is one of the things that uh, some of my panelists, distinguished panelists, will, will, uh, will talk about. But you can see, you know, if you're looking at kind of the bulk of the money, uh, you know, uh, Yeshi mentioned I, I had a panel the other day. Um, one of the panelists has 70 billion U.S. dollars in alternatives, of which 10 billion is in Asia and will probably triple in the next couple of years. Is any of that going to venture? It can't because venture can't absorb that money. Right? But what it is going into, it's going into wealth creation, it's going into healthcare, it's going into growing other companies where individuals will then be consumers or users, or their children could be at the forefront of science. But it's indirect, you see. So the question then is, where, where can direct capital from? If you're looking at investors, they typically are quite intense. And that's why I'm going to hand over now uh, and let Tim introduce himself. But I, you know, one of the things that we wanted to try to look into is, you know, how can we step away from this? And, and where is our future? So that's just, I want to set a little bit of a scene. I'll hand over to Tim, that, Tim, if you'd like to come up and um, say a couple of words on the perspective you're coming from, and then we'll have a little bit of a chat. Thank you.